Hi, hello there. Welcome to supporting processors and upgrading memory. So for the objectives of this video lecture, so at the end of this uh, video lecture, you should be able to compare the characteristics and purposes of Intel and AMD processors used for personal computers. Install and upgrade a processor, compare the different kinds of physical memory and how they work. And of course, the last one would be upgrade memory. So let's start with types and characteristics of a processors. Okay, so basically, processor is said to be the brain of the computing systems. Okay, so processor or microprocessor or CPU or the central processing unit as they call it, these are basically installed on the motherboard. It determines systems computing power. So there are two major processor manufacturers and they are Intel or the integrated electronics and AMD or the advanced micro devices. So what are the types and characteristics of processors? So features affecting processor performance and compatibility with the motherboard. So let's take a look at these features starting with processor speed okay so processor speed so we're talking about the clock speed which are measured the number of cycles your cpu executes per second okay and these are usually measured in terms of frequency and the unit is gigahertz or simply hertz okay so the next one would be a socket and the chipset the processor can use so when you say socket, okay, so socket is the array of pins and the securing mechanism that hold the processor in place and connect the motherboard to the available processing power. Okay, so in most basic sense, a chipset is a group of electronic components on the motherboard that manages data between the processor, the RAM, the storage devices, and other connected hardware. Okay, so next would be the processor architecture. So the processor architectures are classified as either the Reduced Instruction Set Computer or RISC or the Complex Instruction Set Computer or the CISC. So the difference between the two classifications is that RISC architectures have a small number of simple general purpose instructions that it's perform one single operation, okay? So essentially providing the basic building blocks of computations. Whereas the CISC architectures, on the other hand, have a large number of more complex instructions that are each capable of performing multiple internal operations, okay? So the next feature is multiprocessing abilities. Okay, so what is multiprocessing? Multiprocessing is the use of two or more central processing units or CPUs within a single computer system. Okay, so the term also refers to the ability of the system to support more than one processor or the ability to allocate tasks between them. Okay, so that is multiprocessing. So the next one is multi-threading, okay? So in computer architecture, the multi-threading is the ability of the central processing unit or CPU or a single core in a multi-core processors to provide multiple threads of execution concurrently supported by the operating systems, okay? You also have the multi-core processing. So basically, a multi-core processor is a single computing component comprised of two or more CPUs that read and execute the actual program instructions. So the individual cores can execute multiple instructions in parallel, increasing the performance of software, which is written to take advantage of the unique architecture. Right? So the next one is dual processor. Okay, so dual processor refers to a computer 
with two separate CPUs or processors. So the processors work in tandem to process data using a technique called multiprocessing. Okay, so instructions are split between the two processors or CPUs, allowing the computer to perform faster than similar machine with only one processor. All right. So the next one is memory cache. Okay, so memory cache is a type of cache memory that is installed and or is part of computer's main random access memory or RAM. Okay. So it is a native cache memory of the RAM that provides faster data accessing and processing capabilities the RAM itself, or than the RAM itself, okay? So the next one is security. Are there any security on the processors? Yes, okay? So security in modern systems is of utmost importance. So device manufacturers are including multiple security features and attack protections into both the hardware and the software design. So for example, the Synopsys, the Signware ARC processor IP includes many security functions in its secured shield. Okay? So end product system or end product system security, however, cannot be guaranteed by using a secure processor alone. Okay, so something like the capability of the processor to detect if it has overheating, the security. Okay, so we have to look on this feature when we're looking or considering the processor. Okay, so the next one would be memory features on the motherboard that the processor can support. Right? So memory features in the motherboard that the processor can support. So the chipsets determine the main characteristics of the motherboard. So what processor it supports, what RAM types it can use, and what bus types and speeds it supports. Okay? So whether it supports standards such as AGP, okay, or the accelerated graphic port and USB, or the universal, universal serial bus and so on. So chipsets are so named because they usually comprise two relatively large chips. Okay, so some chipsets contain three or more chips. A few chipsets, most of which are intended for low-cost systems, have all functions on one physical chip. Okay, so the next one is support for virtualization. Okay, so if you are working on virtual machines, so you should be looking on this feature. So you can see that on your uh, CMOS okay, or BIOS settings. Okay. So virtualization is a technology that lets you create useful IT services using resources that are traditionally bound to hardware. So it allows you to use the physical machine's full capacity by distributing its capabilities among many users or environments. Okay. So again, if you're, look, if you're working on virtualization, for instance, you are working on virtual box, okay, or um, Hyper-V, and you are using your laptop or your computer to create multiple virtual machines, okay, so test your systems or programs, or maybe you are testing some applications over the network, okay? So this feature is a good one, okay, and as, a, as an IT, okay, so we have to consider turning this on, on the CMOS uh, settings, all right? So, and the last one would be the integrated graphics. So we're talking about the built-in display adapter onto your motherboard, okay? All right, so how a processor works. So basic components, basically, you're gonna have the IO or the input-output unit, so it manages data and instructions entering and leaving the processor. So you also have the control unit with, which manages all activities inside the processors. Okay. So the control unit basically is the main controller of the CPU. Okay. And also we have the arithmetic logic unit. So which is capable of performing all the mathematical operations, calculations, Okay, and logical operations involved. 
So all of these components is within a processor. Okay. So next is we do have registers inside a processor. So registers is a small holding areas on processor chip. Okay. It holds counters, data, instructions, and addresses ALU is currently processing. So basically registers is the storage. All right. So also you're going to have the internal memory caches, L1, L2, L3, and some has L4 cache. Okay. So this basically are the internal memory. Okay. Or the memory within the processor. So it holds data and instructions to be processed by the ALU. Okay. So the L2 cache holds data that is likely to be accessed by the CPU next. In most modern CPUs, the L1 and L2 cache are present on the CPU cores themselves, with each core getting its own cache. All right. So the L3 cache or the level 3 cache is the largest cache memory unit and also the slowest one. Okay. You also have the buses. So buses connects components within the processor housings. All right. So this basically are the transmission media. Okay. So to move data from one location to the other. Okay. So all of these are buses. The lines connecting or the wires connecting registers to ALU. Okay. To the control unit. So the I.O. unit going to the terminal memory, all of those are buses. Okay. Okay. So the next one would be processor frequency or speed. Okay. So this is the speed at which the processor operates internally. So the CPU clock speed or the clock rate is measured in Hertz. So generally nowadays, this is in terms of gigahertz. So a CPU clock speed rate is a measure of how many clock cycles a CPU can perform per second. Okay. So the next one is the multiplier. So factor multiplied against the system bus frequency. So it determines the processor frequency. Okay. So this is also called the clock ratio. It is the speed ratio between the computer's front side bus or the FSB and the CPU. For example, a 10x CPU multiplier runs the CPU at 10 times the speed of the front side bus. So the CPU multiplier is changed in the BIOS setup. Okay. So that is system bus frequency times the multiplier. That is the processor frequency. Okay. Now processor sold today contains ALUs and registers that can process 32 bits or 64 bits at a time. Okay. So we call it hybrid processors. All right. So there are three categories of processors. I have mentioned earlier the hybrid processors. Okay. So which is known as the x86 or 64 processors. This can handle a 32 bit OS or 64 bit OS. So AMD produced the first one called AMD 64. Okay, now the first one would be the 32-bit processors. So also known as the x86 processor. So it can handle a 32-bit instructions from the OS. Okay, so basically this type of processor a computer has not only affects its overall performance, but it can also dictate what type of software it uses. Okay, now this 32-bit processor was the primary processors used in all computers until the early 1990s. Okay, so if you still remember, Intel Pentium processors and an early AMD processors, they were 32 bits, which means the operating systems and the software work with the data units that are 32 bits wide. So Windows 95, Windows 98, Windows XP are all 32-bit operating systems. All right. So the next one is 64-bit processors, also known as the X64 processors or the IA64. Okay. So the 64-bit computer originated in 1961 
when IBM created the first IBM 7030 stretch supercomputer. However, it was not put into use in home computers until the early 2000s. Okay, so Microsoft released a 64-bit version of Windows XP to be used on those computers with 64-bit processors. So Windows Vista, Windows 7, and Windows 8 also comes in 64-bit versions. All right. Okay, so next would be the memory cache. You've got the L1, L2, or the L3 cache. I have mentioned earlier about these caches. Okay, so a CPU cache is a hardware cache used by the central processing unit or CPU of a computer to reduce the average cost, time, or energy to access data from the memory. Okay, so a cache is a smaller, faster memory located closer to the processor core, which stores copies of the data from frequently used main memory locations. So most CPUs have a hierarchy of multiple cache levels, L1, L2, or L3 cache, and rarely even L4 cache. So with separate instruction specific and data specific caches at level one. Okay, so next one would be the memory controller. So included in the processor package, significant increase in system performance. So the memory controller is part of the chipset. And this controller establishes the information flow between the memory and the CPU. A bus is a data path in a computer consisting of various parallel wires to which the CPU, the memory, and all the I.O. or the input-output devices are connected. I have mentioned earlier about these buses. Okay, next, how does the CPU cache work? Okay, so as you might already be aware, so a program is designed as a set of instructions to be run by the CPU. Okay, so when you run a program, these instructions have to make their way from the primary storage to the CPU. This is where the memory hierarchy comes into play. All right, so the data first gets loaded into the RAM and is then sent to the CPU. CPUs these days are capable of carrying out gigantic number of instructions per second. So to make full use of its power, the CPU needs access to super fast memory. This is where the cache comes in. All right, you've got the L1, the L2, and the L3 cache. Now, the memory controller does the job by taking the data from the RAM and sending it to the cache, depending upon which the CPU is in your system. So this controller can either be on the north bridge, okay, on the, of the motherboard or inside the CPU itself. So the cache then carries out the back and forth of the data within the CPU. So the hierarchy of the memory exists within the cache as well. So there are three levels basically. All right, you've got the L1, L2, and the L3 cache here. Okay, so the hierarchy here is again according to the speed and thus the size of the cache. So let's start with the L1 here. So if you are working on a quad core processor, okay, so core or each core has their own L1 cache and L2 cache, but they are sharing the L3 cache here, okay? Now the level one or L1 cache is the fastest memory that is present in a computer system. So in terms of priority, okay, or priority of access, the L1 cache has the data the CPU is most likely to need while completing a certain task. So as far as the size goes, the L1 cache typically goes up to 256 kilobytes. Okay. However, some really powerful CPUs and are now taking it close to 1 MB. So some server chipsets like the Intel's top end Xeon CPUs now have somewhere between 1 to 2 MB of the L1 cache. All right. 
Now, the L1 cache is usually split in two ways, into the instruction cache and the data cache. The instruction cache deals with information about the operation that the CPU has to perform, while the data cache holds the data on which the operation is to be performed. Okay? Now, let's talk about the L2 cache here. Now, the level 2 cache is slower than the level 1 cache but bigger in size. So its size typically varies between 256 KB to 8 MB, although the newer powerful CPUs tend to go past that. Okay. Now the level two cache holds the data that is likely to be accessed by the CPU next. So in most modern CPUs, the L1 and L2 cache are present on the CPU cores themselves, with its core getting its own cache. Okay, and the last one is the shared layer tree cache here. Okay, this is the largest memory or cache memory unit and also the slowest one. So it can range between 4 MB to upwards of 50 MB. Okay, so modern CPUs have dedicated space on the CPU die for the L3 cache and it takes up a large chunk of the space. All right. Now we have here the different Intel processors. Basically, you've got the Core i7 here down to uh, the previous versions of Intel processors. They basically differ in terms of the speed. Okay. So for, for the fifth generation Broadwell processors, you've got the Core i7 up to 3.8 gigahertz. And if you'll observe, it has a 6 MB cache quad core. Okay. So the memory supported is 1333, 1600, 1866 megahertz DDR3 memory. And also it has the dual channel memory. Okay. So you also have the core i5, which is up to 3.6 gigahertz. So basically, we have several releases of the core i7 and i5, or even i3 from different generations, All right? So you also have here the earlier or the, shall we call the legacy processor from Intel. Okay, so they've got Pentium, okay, up to 3.7 gigahertz, but the cache is 4 MB, okay, on some dual core. You also have here the Atom processor, which was used on smallest laptop or smaller laptops. Okay, so which up to 2.1 gigahertz there. All right. Now the Intel processors for identification or processor identification, you've got the processor number. So two core i7 processor are identified as i7-940 and i7-920. Okay, so the Centrino technology improves the laptop performance. During the first release of the laptops, okay, so it says powered by Centrino technology or Centrino Ready, which basically improves the laptop performance. Okay, so processor, chipsets, wireless network adapter are interconnected as a unit. Okay, now for the Intel Atom processor, so low powered processor used in low-cost desktops or laptops and netbooks. So basically, it gets popular because of the netbooks. Okay, so it's smaller than the traditional laptop and it's a low-cost version okay, of the Intel processor, Intel Atom, right? Now for the AMD, they also have their own releases of processor, okay? So the core speed is up to 3.6 gigahertz. They also have the quad core, okay, six core and the octa core. So that is for the FX Black Edition family. So also they have this Phenom family, which is up to three gigahertz. Okay, so six cores, okay, they, they also have quad core or the triple core. So depending on the socket. Okay, so just like Intel, 
AMD also has their series of processors. Okay. Now, same thing. If the Intel has the legacy processor, we also have that on AMD. Okay. So something like the Sempron or the Athlon. Okay. So which was released then. Okay. So that's go against with Pentium or Intel Pentium. Okay. Now, selecting and installing a processor. So, for the PC repair technician tasks, so basically, they need to assemble a PC from parts. Okay. So, exchange a faulty processor, add a processor, and upgrade an existing processor. Okay. So, one must know how to match processor to the systems. So, from our previous discussion, Okay, so there should be compatibility between the processor and the motherboard. All right, so when you assemble a computer, so you have to purchase the motherboard and the processor at the same time. And if possible, you could also have purchased at the same time. Okay, so your chassis with a power supply. Okay. So select a processor to match the system needs. So first requirement is select a processor that the motherboard is designed to support. So basically you have to identify first, okay, so what processor you want, and then you have to choose what motherboard is compatible with your processor. Okay, so afterwards you have to select the best processor meeting general system requirements and the user needs. So may have to sacrifice performance for a cost. All right. So most of us, we, we stick with our budget. So basically, if we only have this budget, okay, so for our computer systems, then we have to work on those hardwares that would fit in onto our budget. Okay. But then if you're, if you don't have that budget constraints and you really want to build your own computer from scratch, well, that might be a little bit pricey, but you'll be getting the performance that you want on a computer system. All right. Okay, so the next one is install a processor. So in installing an Intel processor in a socket, LGA1150, we've talked about the, the different types of sockets from the previous chapters, okay? So the first thing to do is to read the motherboard user guide and follow the directions. Okay, so if you don't have the manual, you could go to the website, okay, of the manufacturer and download from there. Okay, so next is you have to use an ESD, okay, strap or anti-static gloves. This is to eliminate the possibility of having the static electricity or the static discharge transferred onto our electronic components. Okay, so which might cause damage to it. So the third one would be remove the socket protective cover. Okay, so open the socket by pushing down on socket lever and gently push away from the socket to lift the cover or to lift the lever. So remove protective cover from the processor. Hold the processor with index finger and thumb and align the processor so that the notches on the edge of the processor line up with the posts embedded on the socket. So we've talked about the zero insertion force last time. So still remember that? You need to apply that here. When you are installing a processor onto the socket, there should be a zero insertion force. Okay? You don't have to force the processor to get it into the socket. Okay? So next would be ensure that the processor is aligned correctly in the socket. Okay, so there is an orientation there. Okay, so whether you, you need to align the processor markings with that of the socket. Okay, and then return the lever to its lock position. All right, so basically this is um, installing the processor. Okay, now this is our guide here. So you've got notches, okay? So that will safety, okay? So the installation of our processor here, okay? So there would be no chance 
that there would be or this would be attached to the sockets okay in other directions because you'll have that guy there or the notches right okay so after installing the processor onto the socket or onto the motherboard so the next thing to do is to install the cooling system okay so you need to install the heat sink and the fan so understand how cooler posts work so apply thermal compound if necessary it may be pre-applied if you already have disassembled your computer and you remove the processor okay so you might want to reapply okay the thermal compound okay so this will uh, ensure that your heatsink okay so will uh, locked in to your processor right so verify locking pins are turned counterclockwise as far as they will go so the next one would be you push down on this locking pin until it pops into the hole okay so connect the power cord from the cooler fan to the motherboard so also you might want to check the bios or the uafi setup to verify the system recognized processor after system up and running okay so basically your motherboard provides at least three fun okay uh connectors onto your motherboard okay so that is denoted by these three pins or four pins okay so before you only have three pins here but then nowadays we have four pins here okay you can connect your cooler fan power cord to the motherboard all right so next would be rest of examples are similar to that of installing a processor in socket lj1150 so differences will be highlighted okay so these procedures here would vary depending on the type of processor you are using but then all of this is stated onto the user manual so from time to time you have to consult your user's manual okay now if you are installing a processor on the LGA 1155 okay so this is what you're going to do so open the socket by pushing down the socket lever and gently push away from the socket so remove the socket protective cover so if you're installing a new processor here okay so hold processor with an index finger and thumb and align processor in socket using the gold triangle and the right angle mark okay so return lever to its lock position okay so again there is an orientation here okay so for the lj1155 you've got the gold triangle there and the right angle mark now if you are installing on socket lga16 or 1366 so you need to open the socket and remove the protective cover so line a processor with two posts on the socket and then lower down the socket load plate and return the lever to lock position again this would vary depending on the type of processor you are working with now if you are installing an intel processor on the socket lga 775 so push down the lever and gently push it away from the socket lift the socket load plate and remove the socket protective cover so orient processors so notches or two edges of the processor line up with two notches on the socket so place the processor on the socket close the socket cover push down the lever and return it to its lock position again when you are installing any processors just make sure you've got a zero insertion force on it okay Now for the AMD, installing an AMD processor in socket AM2 Plus, okay? So basically, they have the same procedures as that of Intel, okay? So again, what I would say is that you just have to consult your user manual or documentations for the installation, all right? 
Okay, so let's talk about replacing the processor in a laptop. So before replacing any component from your laptop, make sure, okay, so that is not under warranty. Otherwise, it will void the warranty that you have there. Okay, now if decide to replace, use CPU supported by manufacturer and notebook model. Okay, so you go ahead and search for the notebook or for your laptop and what are the supported uh, CPU, okay, so by manufacturer. So for many laptops, remove the cover on the button to expose the processor fan and the heatsink assembly. So some laptops may require you to remove the keyboard and the keyboard bezel to reach the fan and assembly processor. So some are using a tampered proof screws. All right. Now, if decided to replace, okay, so lift the CPU from the socket, lift straight up without bending the CPU pins. So before placing the new processor into the socket, be sure that the socket screw is in an open position. So place the processor into its socket, use thermal compound on top of the processor if necessary. Okay. Now let's talk about memory technologies now. So random access memory or RAM. So it holds data and instructions used by the CPU. Okay. And usually we are using a dynamic RAM or DRAM. So memory modules used onto the motherboard. But there are some considerations on installing a memory. Okay. Now here are the different variations of DRAM. So I've got DIMMs. Okay, dual inline memory module. You also have the so dim or the small outline dual inline memory module, so which are usually used in laptops. So you also have the micro dims used on sub notebook computers, and you also have RIMs and SIMs which are already outdated. So RIM is Rambus, okay, technology. Now differences among variations of DRAM so are the data path with each module accommodates and how data moves from the system bus to the module. Mostly nowadays we are working on DIMMs. All right, so we have here several types of memory. Okay, so we have the SIM here, which is the single inline memory module. Okay, so um, SIM connectors and therefore, the slots situated on the motherboard are created for metal, gold, or tin. So in SIM, pins present in either face set are connected. So there are two types of SIMs. Presents one with 30 pins and the other one with 72 pins here. Okay. So we have 30 pins and 72 pins. We call it EDO or extend the data out. Okay, so these are SIMs. The rest of this are called DIMMs except for RIM, which was having 184 pins and two notches near the center to the edge connector. So you can differentiate and determine, okay, so the different types of DIMMs using the notches. Okay, so RIMs having two notches almost at the center this 168-pin SDRAM DIMM here, having two notches, one almost at the center and the other one on the outer side or outer area. Okay, so the 184 DDR DIMM has one notch. Okay, you've got 240-pin DDR DIMM, DDR3, and you've got DDR4. Okay, so these are the different technologies of memory that we are now using on our computer systems nowadays. Okay, now the dual inline memory module usually is a 64 bit data path. Okay, it also has a metal connector similar to SIM, but either of the sides of the connector does not rely on the other or does not rely on the other. So advanced motherboards uses 168, 184, 240 pin DIMMs. It consumes 3.3 volts of power and can store from 32 MB up to 1 GB of memory. Okay. 
So, um, types of dim, you've got the 168 pin dim and the 184 and 240 pin dims. Okay. Alright, so also let's take a look at the difference between sims and dims here. So basically, they differ in terms of the number of bits. So dims are usually working on the 64 bit. Now, power consumption, dim is uh, less power, 3.3 volts. But the storage provided is basically for dim that could go beyond 1 GB. All right. So dim technologies, you've got the DDR or the double data rate SDRAM. So also called DDR SDRAM. So they have this SDRAM2 or the DDR. So this is two times faster than the SDRAM and uses 184 pins. So this is already obsolete. Okay. So DDR2 is faster than DDR. Basically, if we have the new version of the RAM, it's basically faster than the old one. All right. So something like DDR3 is faster than DDR2, DDR4 is far, uh, faster than DDR3 and so on. Okay, so factors that affect capacity, feature, and performance of TIMS. So basically, you've got the number of channels they use, how much RAM is on one DIM, speed, error checking abilities, and buffering. Okay, so early single channel DIMMs, memory controller is accessed one DIM at a time. And then later on, we had dual channels. Okay, so memory controller communicates with two DIMMs at the same time and doubles memory access speed. Okay, so we will be talking about this later on. So you also have the triple channels, accesses three DIMMs at once. So DDR2, DDR3, and DDR4 DIMMs use dual channels. Okay, so including the DDR. We also have the quad channels, which are being used by DDR3 and DDR4. Okay, now what's the difference between those channeling so let's start with quad channeling here so it was introduced with intel sandy bridge chipsets and processors so processor can access four dims at a time okay so they are called channels and the one two and four configurations are most common ones found today but we also have the three um channels okay so the channels basically refer to the stack of sticks known as the RAM. So each stick is a RAM and your memory channel classification depends on how many sticks are stacked against each other. Okay. So if there's just one, then you have to have a single channel or single memory channel. So if there's two, then you have a dual memory channel and so on. So that's how it works. Okay. Now you might be asking, what do these memory channels do exactly? Okay. So think of these channels or memory channels as roads that the data passes through. So with more roads available, the data process becomes faster because there's not much competition there. Okay. Now, how does this work with the gigabytes in a RAM? Okay. So, okay. So let's say you have a brand new phone and it says 32 GB RAM. Okay. So this 32 GB RAM can be a single channel. It could be a dual channel or a quad channel. Hence, it can be one stick of 32 GB, two sticks of 16 GB, which is also equals 32 GB. Okay. For that's 16 times two and might be four sticks of 8 GB. Hence, two things aren't exactly interchangeable. Okay, so just because you have a 32 GB RAM doesn't instantly mean that you have a quad memory channel and vice versa. Okay, now, so does the number of channels even matter? Okay, so this is where things can get a bit confusing. 
but we'll try to explain this thoroughly as possible. Okay, so remember, the RAM refers to the memory and the channels talk about the road that those memories pass through. Now imagine if you have one 32GB RAM stick installed in your PC. That's a single memory channel. Alright, now next, you also have two 16GB RAM, which means that there is a dual memory channel. Both have 32GB RAM in total. But in terms of performance, you will find that the dual channel or the dual memory channel runs better. Why? Because a dual setup doubles the bandwidth, giving the memory more space to move around. In the same vein, a quad memory channel with a total of 32 GB RAM would perform better than a dual setup because this time the roads for information are quadrupled. Okay, so we're talking about quad there. Okay, so you have more bandwidth around that space. Okay, now next would be setting up for dual channeling so i have already mentioned earlier the quad let's talk about the dual channeling so pair of dims in a channel must be equally matched so considering the size same size same speed features and as much as possible same manufacturer okay so broadly speaking in theory of dual channel configuration doubles the data transfer rate of your system compared to a single channel mode so a matching memory module pair is bundled along with a parallel access to both memory channels. Okay. So requirements for dual channel mode. Okay. So definitely you need to arrange the DIMMs in pairs in every memory channel or module pair. Okay. So next would be identical module capacity. All right. As mentioned here. Of the module pair, if you are using 128 MB or 256 MB or 512 MB or 1 GB, etc., whatever. Okay, so identical DRAM technology of the module pair, identical DRAM bus width of the DRAM used on the module pair. Okay, so both modules either only single sided, one rank, or only dual sided, two ranks. Okay, so mirror inverted assembly. Of the memory slots so please note configurations that do not fulfill these requirements automatically work in a single mode all right so basically you need to consult your motherboard documentations regarding setting up channeling okay so take note that the slowest dim built into the system determines the pace of the clock bus or the bus clock and memory access of the complete RAM. Okay, so the following requirements within the module do not have to be fulfilled. So same manufacturer of the module, all right, so identical timing, access times, same speed category of the DDR modules, say PC2100, PC2700, or PC3200, and so on. Okay, so next we have what you call the dual channel interleave mode. Okay, so the dual channel interleave mode provides the highest performance. It is activated whenever a particular total capacity of the built in modules is identical in both channels. Okay, so take a look at this channel A, slot 0, channel A, slot 1. So this is channel A here, you've got channel B there, and so on. Okay. So take note that the slowest dim built into the system determines the pace of the bus clock and the memory access for the complete RAM. However, it is important that the total capacity of a channel A and B is identical, like what we have here, 1 GB, 1 GB. So a requirement that can be met with two, three, or four dims, all right? So requirements for dual channel interleaved mode. So arrangement of the DIMMs in both memory channels, identical total capacity 
in all memory channels and mirror inverted assembly on memory slots. Okay, so please note configurations that do not fulfill these requirements automatically work in single channel. And take note, single channel, well, dual channel is better than that or the quad channel is better than the dual channel and so on. All right, so if you want to consider setting up a triple channeling, so same principle applies, no? So there are three DIMMs slots populated with three matching DDR DIMMs here. So you have to complete, okay, or to fulfill or filled up these memory banks here. So you might be wondering, why is it that my laptop is not left with one memory bank available so why is it that if i have an 8 gb laptop and i have two memory banks why is it that they filled it up with either two 4 gb why not single 8 gb that is because of the channeling all right okay so next would be dim speed so measured in terms of megahertz and pc rating so PC rating is the total bandwidth difference or between module and the CPU. So DDR2 PC rating usually labeled PC2. DDR3 PC rating is usually labeled PC3 and so on. Okay. Next, you also have the single-sided DIMM memory chips installed on one side of the memory module only. So if you try to look at your memory modules, so there are chips only on one side and maybe you have seen also another RAM that is double-sided. We call it double-sided DIMMs. We have chips at both sides of the RAM. Okay. So you also have the memory bank, memory and processor addresses at one time. So usually this is 64 bits wide. And you also have the dual ranked. So DIMMs providing two or more banks reduces overall memory price at the expense of performance okay so also on the memory you'll have this ECC or the error correcting code so it detects and corrects error in a single bit so application ECC makes 64 bit dim a 72 bit module because because of the parity or the parity bit which is used for error corrections all right so Parity is used by older sims, so error checking based on the extra or ninth bit. If it is an add parity, parity bit set to make add number of ones. Okay, and if it is even, parity bit set to make even number of ones. We're talking about the number of ones there. How many ones are there on the given group? Okay. Next, buffered and registered DIMMs hold data and amplify signal before data is written. So unregistered DIMM uses registers, unbuffered DIMM, no buffers or register support. All right. So the next one would be a cast latency and a RAS latency. Okay. So a RAM module, CAS, column, address, strobe, or signal, Latency is how many clock cycles it takes for the RAM module to access a specific set of data in one of its columns, hence the name, and make that data available on its output pins starting from when a memory controller tells it to. Okay, So when buying a RAM, you'll see listings of their timings, such as CL16, 1818, 38, or CL 14, 14, 14, 34, and so on. Okay, so that's the number, or the number after that CL represents the RAM gets cast latency, sometimes called CL. Now, but what does this cast latency really mean? Okay, so do we care about this? And what implications does a RAM get cast latency have for each performance? Okay, so let's put it this way. All right, so the lower the cast latency, the better okay so the lower the values the better okay so a ram modules cast column address job or signal latency is how many clock cycles in it takes for the ram module to access the specific set of data 
in one of its columns, hence the name, and makes that data available on its output pins, starting from when a memory controller tells it to. Okay, so that's basically the concepts behind CAS latency and RAS latency. You just have to consider a RAM kit with CAS of 16 takes 16 RAM clock cycles to complete this task. So again, the lower the CAS latency, the better. All right, so what are the types of memory used in laptops? Usually we are using sodium, DDR2 sodium, okay? So only use the type of memory the laptop is designed to support. Do not install any other laptop beyond the specifications of it. All right. Okay, so how to upgrade memory. So to upgrade the memory means to add more RAM to a computer. So adding more RAM might solve slow performance, applications refusing to load. Okay, so an unstable system and Windows insufficient memory error message. So basically, when you put or add another module or memory onto your system, so that simply means you can open as many applications as you want to. All right? Okay, so questions to ask. How much RAM do I need and how much is currently installed? Okay, you're going to ask yourself that. Okay? So how many and what kind of memory modules are currently installed on my motherboard? Now, if you decided to upgrade the RAM, just ensure that your motherboard supports your intended or your target RAM or upgrade RAM. All right. So the, the, the very basic um, rule here is that, okay, so you check your motherboard and you check the type of memory and the maximum RAM supported by your motherboard. So how many and what kind of modules can I fit onto my motherboard? What do I select and purchase the right modules for my upgrade? Or how do I select and purchase the right modules for my upgrade? How do I physically install the new modules? Well, basically there's no problem with the installation here. It's just that you have to work on the compatibility okay, of your upgrade memory onto your motherboard or current system okay so best answer all you can get okay so windows 8 or windows 7 require at least 2 gb of ram so but more is better okay so ram limit for 32 bit os is only 4 gig so that's why we are shifting to 64 bit which would allow to to give us up to 128 gb of ram all right so 64-bit installation of Windows 7 Home Premium can use up to 16 GB of RAM. So for Windows 10, you could go ahead and check the documentation. All right. So how many and what kind of modules are currently installed? So you have to investigate. You have to know. Okay, so your current settings. So how many slots? How many are filled? Okay. Review module imprint. Take note. Most of the system nowadays is working on a dual channel or a triple channel or a quad channeling okay and usually we have no more spaces left for us to upgrade so to do so we need to upgrade all of them or all of the ram all, all of the ram there okay next would be examine the module for physical size and notch position so this is very important otherwise that will burn your ram all right so just make sure you are installing it in the correct orientation. Okay, so always read the motherboard documentation. So last resort, take motherboard and old memory modules to a good computer parts store for confirmation. All right, so the next one would be how many and what kind of memory modules can fit onto my motherboard. So again, you need to consult your documentation. Okay, so the more RAM you have, the more amount of RAM you have, that, that's the better. But then take note that motherboard supports channeling. So dual, triple, or quad channeling. And most of the time, when we purchase our computer, when we told them, okay, so I want an 8 GB RAM on it, 
so may motherboard supports dual channel so they will instead load four or two four gb on your motherboard all right with no left available spaces for the future upgrade okay so what you can do is you need to replace both ram on it next motherboard using ddr3 dual channel dims so install matching dims into blue slots and matching dims in the two black slots so this is how ddr3 dual channel works of course you've got color coding on the memory banks okay so possible to use three dims and dual channeling so must install matching dims and the two blues and the third dim is in a black slot. Okay, so motherboard using DDR3 triple channel. So use three matching dims in the three blue slots. A fourth slot populated board reverse to a single channeling. So this is what we're avoiding here. So if you want, if you do understand the concept of dual channeling, triple channeling, or quad channeling, you don't want to go back to the single channeling. Okay. Next, motherboard using DDR3 triple channel dims. So follow the motherboard documentations. So on the RAM, we have what you call the serial presence detect. Okay. So well, today's memory always supports SPD. Okay. So dim technology that declares module size, speed, voltage, and data pass with through a system BIOS or startup. So that is the small chip there onto your RAM. Okay, so in computing, this SPD or the serial presence detect is a standard way to automatically access information about the memory module. And we usually see that on the BIOS setup. Okay, motherboard using DDR DIMMs with dual channeling, so allows three different DDR DIMM speeds in one to four sockets supports dual channeling. So two blue memory slots and two black slots. Okay, so for dual channeling, so matching DIMMs must be installed into the two blue sockets. So if two DIMMs installed in the two black sockets, they must match each other. Okay, so always consult your documentation for this. Next, compromises if the exact match is not available. Well, mixing unbuffered memory with buffered or registered memory will not work. Okay, so match memory modules manufacture if possible. In a pinch, try using memory from two different manufacturers. So if mixing memory speeds, all modules perform the slowest speed. Take note of this. All right, next. So how do I select and purchase the right memory module? So you can go ahead and check some websites Okay, so to research your purchase, look for search utility matching modules to board. So we'll have that. If you are working on a laptop, okay, and you are looking for a replacement, you could just type in the model of your laptop in there. All right. Now, how do I install the new modules, assuming that it has arrived already? You ordered it and it has arrived and because you have decided to upgrade your RAM. So always take uh, precautions in installing a new module. So always use an ESD strap, turn off power, unplug power cords, press power button, remove the case cover, handle memory modules with care, do not touch the edge connectors, do not stack cards or modules, and look for notches on one side or in the middle for the correct orientation. You can see the notches on each uh, memory bank, all right? So just try to match your RAM with that on the memory bank, all right? So installing DIMMs, pull out the supporting arms on both sides of the slot, use notches on the, the DIMM edge connector as a guide, insert the DIMM straight down into the slot and ensure supporting arms lock into position. So new installations are generally uncomplicated. Usually involve placing the memory on the motherboard. Older computers may need to change the BIOS setup. If new memory not recognized, try reseating. When say reseating, you just have to remove it and place it again there. Okay, so try to reseat. 
Now on your laptop, so upgrade process is similar to desktops. Again, when you're working on your laptop, just ensure that the warranty is already voided. Otherwise, if there is still a warranty and you open it, so your warranty is voided. All right, so search for the best buy on a suitable authorized part. General steps, decide on how much memory to upgrade, purchase the memory, and then install it. All right, so that ends up this video lecture. We've talked about the processor, okay, processor sockets, the memory technologies, all right, so the memory cache, the AMD and Intel processors, selecting the processors that matches the motherboard or that supports the motherboard, and how to properly install RAM on our computer systems. So that ends up our video lecture. Have a great day.